So welcome everyone. Welcome to this uh, Market Thursday. Uh, we are the 1st of April uh, 2021. It's 8 p.m. in London. Um, and we're going to do this uh, webinar that uh, we try to do every two weeks now. Um, as always, as a quick uh, disclaimer, uh, those webinars are not investment advice. So this is purely for information and trying to help you in your uh, trading journey. Uh, so please do your own research before doing anything. And as always, uh, take everything that I'm saying with a pinch of salt. Uh, quickly for the newcomers, um, I started to work in uh, 2000 as a cash equity trader in Paris, uh, working for a company and asset manager called uh, Pierre Charon Gestion, uh, then for another fund manager called DTIM, where we had roughly 50 million euro under management. In 2004, I uh, arrived in London, uh, working for a um, hedge fund called Griffin Capital Management, where um, I joined first on their long only product, then uh, as well on their long short product. So that was um, originally Griffin Capital Management was mostly on the Eastern European. Um, then they created this Western European team that I joined. Um, and we had at the peak a uh, bit more than 600 million euro for the Western part. And for the Eastern part, they had um, two or three billion. In 2009, I joined Infinity Capital Markets from 2009 to 2018, where I was a prop trader. No, um, no constraint on my mandate, uh, regions, whatever I wanted to trade, as long as you're making money. And I recently rejoined them in January of this year. Uh, so the last couple of months on top of doing the mentoring, I've been doing uh, more trading. In 2014, I joined another uh, trading education company um, that I left in 2017. And uh, in 2018, I restarted the mentoring program, my own mentoring program. And at the end of 2019, I launched a four by four video series, which is um, a video course to help you trading and investing in the market. So today, what are we gonna be covering? As always, we're gonna be starting with looking at the situation across asset classes, uh, stocks, credit, commodities, and FX. So a bit of price action and as well, a bit of macro analysis. Then we're going to be looking a bit backwards of what happened in Q1 2021 and what might happen uh, in the next few months. We're going to be starting to discuss the earnings season. Uh, why? Because the earnings season, as we will see, is starting in only in a couple of weeks. Then, uh, obviously, we're going to be talking about Archegos. The Archegos, which is the um, the family office that recently blew up uh, in, in in the market, so we're talking about leverage concentration. So, in terms of market um, today, in terms of macro, should I say we had the ISM manufacturing in the US uh, with a print at sixty four point seven percent, which is um, it's not coming from me, but it's like thirty seven years. High. Um, the new the prices were still very high at 85%. I think the new orders were at 67%, something like this. So pretty strong. If you look at the comments, the comments are still telling you that um, the value chain uh, there is some 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 struggle in the value chain because of the world reopening. Because so there um, again the world and especially the US uh, with the Fed and 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 the uh, the new. Uh, the Biden uh, administration is really, um, this is exactly what we said a month ago. Uh, the, the, the market, the economy is running, is running really hot. So it's, it's really, it really feels like a hot potato. Um, there is a lot of, of new experiments uh, uh, that started with uh, those fiscal stimulus, those monetary stimulus. We still don't know what's going to be the outcome. But clearly, um, the economy, the U.S. economy, is running pretty strong. If you look at uh, even uh, the ISM for the uh, the PMI, should I say, uh, in Europe, were uh, pretty strong. Uh, so we know that um, there is a caveat here with with Europe closing. So France is closing, uh, Italy is closing again, Germany is, is is still closed, and 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 same with the Dutch. So if you take the world GDP. And, and Europe making 15, 17% of, of the GDP. 
uh, there is a chance that over the next couple of months, those those this part of the world is going to be slowing. But the 23, 25% of the US is, is really, really strong. China overnight was, uh, the ISM was not that great. And finally, if you look at obviously um, um, all those ISM, uh, those PMIs combined, you end up with uh, the JP Morgan world manufacturing at 55%, which is uh, again, very, very strong. So um, we had um, the, the fiscal stimulus that was signed now because I think it's not gonna be enough. Obviously you need to do a bit more. The Biden administration is, is calling for two trillion, between two and four trillion um, infrastructure stimulus. So if you take two trillion, that makes 10% of the GDP. If you take four trillion, that makes 20% of the US GDP. So you see again, the size of those possible um, stim stimulus that are gonna be coming. Here, there is another caveat, which is um, um, it might be financed and probably going to be financed by a uh, raise of the, the corporate taxes. So corporate taxes have been lowered massively under the Trump administration, uh, which made uh, EPS going massively in 2017 and 2018. But, you know, um, to finance those kind of stimulus at one stage, <laughs> you need to find some money somewhere. Um, and uh, this is why uh, the Biden administration is, will probably be calling for corporate taxes to, to go higher. Um, in terms of, of timing, um, because there's gonna be a bit of everything today uh, as always, um, we are going into the earning season as we're gonna see later, but as well, in terms of special situation, we have the uh, dividend season, okay? So more specifically in Europe, the next three months, most the companies will be uh, going ex dividend, okay? And that means depending obviously where you are in the world and where and if you pay taxes, um, that's gonna have implication, but um, we are talking normal dividend and we are going uh, talking special dividend. So if you take a day like today, um, that was um, Volvo. Volvo came with a 15 krona, a Swedish krona. Uh, dividend, uh, which makes, you know, six to seven percent dividend on the day. So um, look at your portfolio, look at your position, but because uh, there are dividends that are coming and, and that's mechanically, uh, you could be giving up uh, 20, 30 percent of the moves of the move on the day based on the, the taxes that you are paying. So let, let's start with um, the uh, situation across classes. Um, and as always, this is um, uh, looking at, um, at starting with, with stocks uh, on the left hand side, as we can see, the market has been pretty strong in the US, 6%. Uh, um, so the year to date is the same as the quarter, uh, the, the first quarter. So we are talking about the Q1 asset performance. S&P was up roughly 6%. Russell uh, who is up, was up 12%, but actually came down uh, five to seven percent from 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 its eyes. Uh, but clearly, it is outperforming um, uh, big caps, and um, and obviously as well the um, everything that is tech. We know as well that something that we discussed before that there has been rotation in the market, meaning that the tech have been underperforming. Uh, the overall market. So value has been outperforming uh, growth. Why? Because as we're going to see later and as we've discussed in the past, uh, bonds have been selling off, meaning yields have been going up. Um, if we uh, look after the US market, you can see that Europe has been doing pretty well. So up 7, 10% year to date. Um, that needs to be um, adjusted from, from FX. Uh, because the, the euro has been weakening a bit, 2 to 3 percent versus the dollar. Um, you can see as well that emerging market, uh, we are talking uh, Brazil, we are talking um, China, we are talking India, have been on the poor, underperforming the market, um, the, the, the broad market. Why? Because the dollar has been pretty strong um, and oil being strong as well, that has uh, created some tension. Um, so that's the overall picture for Q1 2021 for, for the stocks. 
in terms of of the purple which uh, stand for the um for the for the currencies dollar has been pretty strong versus um, versus the other currencies um the BTC, the Bitcoin, we don't have the chart, so it's up 100%, so it's off the chart. So, you know, I didn't want to, to put um, the BTC move uh, because literally it was distorting everything. Um, and you know that now it's trading between 5,000 and 6,000. At the right hand uh, of, this, uh, of this chart, we have WTI uh, up 20% on the year, uh, but uh, came down 15% from its highs. You know, it's trading around $60 uh, dollar today. Uh, from this, its eyes at 68. What is interesting is today there was the OPEC announcement uh, with actually the Saudis saying that they are not going to increase their uh, production uh, for the next three months. Um, the first, at, at the start of the afternoon, the talks were for the Saudis actually to slowly but surely uh, increase the production. <laughs> it seems to like a the US secretary just called them and said, look guys, if you could not do anything for the next three months, that'd be great. So uh, oil market, um, we are blaming the hedge funds, we are blaming fa family offices, but actually uh, if we are talking about a market that is well manipulated, uh, we can be talking about the oil market uh, because you have all those producers that are deciding where should be uh, more or less the market from time to time. Gold is down 10%. Uh, market has been on a risk on um, and gold has been really struggling so uh, down 10 percent and at the so it's reading around the 1700 into the next slide uh, the week to date um, so that is the picture we had um, over the last five days a risk on rally and um, when we uh, look at the market a couple of weeks ago i told you that i was thinking that the market will go into the expiry at 4000 we didn't we sold off a bit and then we went to 38.50. So right after the, the expiry on the Tuesday, Wednesday, there was a, a little blip of, of volatility, but very, very small. But overall, the market is on a, a risk on mode, uh, a lot of inflow. So if you look at the ETF.com website and go and look at the flows for March, <clears throat> there has been huge inflows into equities, uh, into passive investment. Um, so there is flow, economy is good, and as we're going to see, central banks are, are around as well. So overall, this is the picture. And then you get the different volatility, obviously, depending on, on the assets. Now let's look at the sectors. Uh, so sectors, uh, the big leader is energy, uh, which makes sense because that's really the link with, uh, with WTI. It's up 30%. It came down roughly same 10% from its highs. I think it's trading XLE, it's trading around $50. Uh, so it has been um, kind of revert, reverting to the mean, but the mean is, is way lower. Financials have been doing very well. We, we discussed a couple of weeks ago, KBE, KRE, uh, JP Morgan. Uh, so the sector has been doing very, very well, which makes sense because the, the, the economy, especially in the US is doing much better. So if the economy is doing better, if the GDP is growing, uh, uh, banks will be doing better. And as well, because of the, uh, the steepening of the yield curve that is massively benefiting uh, the banks. Um, so overall, all the sectors are positive. Industrials are doing pretty well. That tells you that uh, there is um, conviction that um, um, the economy, the cycle is on and as well, obviously with the materials and, and with the infrastructure and all those fiscal stimuli that is helping uh, those, uh, those sectors to outperform the S&P 500. Um, on the week to date, uh, let's, not, let's overall, um, everything is up uh, 2%. So uh, that means over the last week, um, there was not that much beta to, uh, sorry, alpha to, to, to generate. It was just like the market going up and up um, 2 to 3% after the, the, the small blip of the, of the uh, expiry, sorry. Um, now looking at other asset classes, the bonds. So we discussed that as well. We know that at the end of 2020, uh, the US 10 years were, uh, was at around 1%. Now it's around 1.7, 1.8%. So there has been a massive sell-off again. Um, 
And that's not only in the US, that is across the world, uh, but really the, uh, the carry trade, if, if you want to, to say it, is, is very strong. Uh, looking at the US, for instance, versus Germany, where we are talking about, you know, 50 to 60 bips differ differential. So that explains as well why the, the dollar has been uh, strengthening. That is something that I discussed before when we look at the euro dollar at 122, 123. I told you that I thought that um, it was a bit of a struggle for the euro to be strengthening a bit more based on the carry trade. Um, so now we are trading around 117, 118. We're going to be looking at the chart later on. Um, but of all, uh, uh, the, the, the move on the bonds has been, has been extremely um, uh, strong. Uh, I should say the, the sell-off has been very strong. We are back to the levels that we had pre-crisis on the 10 years. Now the question is, uh, how quickly are we going to go from 170 to 2% or more? If we go too quickly, then that's going to be um, that's going to be even more an issue for um, for the rotation in the market and for the overall market. Um, in terms of volatility, uh, VIX is not perfect, but that gives us um, a, a comprehension of, of of the overall volatility of the market. VIX is now, um, I think, um, 20 minutes ago it was at 18 percent. So VIX is now trading below 20 percent. We know. Again, we discussed before that it takes time after a crisis for um, uh, uh, the VIX to come down. Why? Because people are still paying quite often this uh, end of the um, end of the spectrum of this of, of this tail uh, to protect themselves. So there is um, overprotection at eighteen percent. It is uh, slowly uh, coming down. That is even more true when you get a long weekend like we have. Uh, uh, this weekend because European markets equities are closed until Tuesday and um, in the US the equity market is closed but the bond market and obviously FX are still open so meaning that tomorrow we get the NFP uh, you could be trading some futures but uh, overall for stocks for single stocks you're not going to be able to do it so NFP a lot of noise uh, tomorrow the expectations I think this is not necessarily a bad thing for most retail traders that they can't be trading um, tomorrow or based on NFP. On the top winners and top losers, I think this week is interesting because obviously um, the idea of putting those five winners and these five losers is not only to uh, put more data into those, those uh, weekly webinars, but it's really trying to identify what is moving in the market. So if you look at the top losers, the five top losers are coming from this uh, story about this um, family office that blew up uh, over the last uh, two weeks. So we are talking either of stocks that they were long or uh, banks that were involved. So Credit Suisse, Nomura, both went down 20%, Viacom, Discovery. So we're going to look at the correlation but that or some of the stocks that uh, this family office was uh, long uh, of. So really what we can see, what I'm trying to do as, uh, as a trader, as a portfolio manager, is trying to get what is moving in the market. So you could start and say, oh, this is the S&P. But as you're getting better, you're going to be scrolling down from the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Russell, and scrolling down to the different levels. So you're going to be having afterwards the sectors that we've done. You can do the industries. So industries, there is a lot of ETF. I strongly advise you to list those ETF and doing the, the screening. This is what we what I do with my mentees, uh, really from one week to another. Then looking at the stocks that are moving. Why? Because it tells you a lot where there is um, uh, momentum on the way up and on the way down and as well obviously when it's on the way down very often where there is a lot of stress um, and here those are it's pretty obvious because it's making the headlines but if you are running those screenings you can before most people knowing where is the stress or where is the momentum okay so that's for the asset class performances um I'm going to be switching into the technical analysis price action. Uh, so as always, starting with the VIX, um, I hope you can still see uh, the, 
a chart here. So the VIX, as I said, you know, again, over and over, the VIX uh, on average since its creation is at 19%. Here we are at 18% uh, roughly. So we are starting to go to trade below the, uh, the average, but you know, in 2017, 2016, which were really hard year for me in terms of, of trading the market, you know, we had volatility at 10, 11, 12%. So as a trader, when uh, volatility is very low, it's really hard because that means there is not much stories happening. Um, but overall, the VIX now is, is, is coming lower. Um, there are calls. If you look at the structure of the market, very often there, there is and there might be turn in the market when there is the OPEX, okay, when options are expiring. So tech put somewhere, note somewhere, uh, that on the third Friday of every month, this is the OPEX. So this is, that's going to be in a couple of weeks. Uh, so I think now, if you look at the calendar, and which is hand in hand with the, um, the start of the earnings season, the next couple of weeks normally should be more or less fine and the market should be uh, ramping higher as long as we don't have, you know, um, a bomb somewhere or something tragic, but, and then, you know, uh, volatility, the structure of the volatility might be uh, changing again, at least for a short period of time. So that's for the VIX. Um, next one, we're gonna be looking at the uh, future of the S&P. I use the futures, why? Because uh, those are liquids. Liquid and I like the chart. So this is the, um, the trend. So let me give you a daily chart. So if that's a bit messy, but uh, um, so this is the, the trend. The trend is still your friend. This is the trend that we started from the election. There is a bit of hiccup, you know, and when we did this, one of these webinars at the start of, of the month of March, when we were in, during, during the, the sell off, but still the trend is still, is still there. Um, uh, looking at this chart, it looks like the 41, 4200 is, is, is the target. Um, so this is the, the, the chart for the, uh, for the S&P. For the NASDAQ composite, uh, you see the breakout today. So um, it feels like, um, uh, and actually the, the, the NASDAQ is outperforming the, the S&P. If you look at well as well at one of the sectors that underperformed a bit, which was the Philly Semiconductor um, um, Index. So we are in logarithmic, we are retesting almost the eyes, but there is a but and the trend has been broken. So that's, uh, I tweeted when it was here. So now we are higher, but the trend is broken. So um, there is, uh, what was it? It was uh, Micron today, which came with good numbers. Um, so obviously at the end of this month, between the 20th and the 30th, we're going to have a lot of tech companies coming. Um, but that's the, if you are looking at the price section and, and the leaders, this is clearly the names that you should be uh, following. If we look now at the Russell, so the Russell, uh, small and mid caps in the US, if we look at the trend, so this is a logarithmic chart. Uh, so that's from the bottom in March uh, and, and really the market uh, from the election has been, and the vaccine has, has been on a tier, despite some, some let's say, uh, um, uh, struggle over the last months and let's say some consolidation, the sector, the, the, the Russell has been uh, very strong. And if we look at the, at the Russell versus uh, the S&P. Okay, so that's uh, the recent performance that we had since since November. So very, very strong. And we are, we are back to level that we had in, in 2019. Um, now let's look at um, uh, value versus growth. Uh, so SPY G versus SPY V. Um, so again, there is still a long way to go, at least for the S&P, for growth, uh, for value, to come back to the level it was against growth at the start of, of last year. Um, similarly, you can be using uh, the same for the Russell, which is IWO versus IWN, and there is still some way to go. So we are probably halfway, a bit less than halfway, if we think that there is a reversion to the mean, where the mean is gonna be uh, around here. Um, like 
What I like to do as well, and, and uh, we're going to be a bit more price action today as well, is, is um, when we do the mentoring, we try to look for uh, between each session to see which of the 11 sectors of the S&P has been doing well. So here we are looking at the technology. So uh, technology have been consolidating now um, since, uh, since the start of this year. But actually, if you look at the XLK versus the SPY, that is more interesting. You can see that actually, you remember or you, rem or you don't remember that we had a peak at the end of August 2020. And since then, we have been consolidating versus the S&P. So uh, the past leaders, meaning uh, XLK, has been, which has outperformed the market massively since 2016. So let me give you a weekly chart. So if you look at 2016, so 2016, it really started to move up. It moved and then we had the acceleration in January 2019. Why? Because the Fed expectations were lowered massively. So if we remember at January 2019, instead of the Fed saying we're going to be increasing rates by 75, uh, yes, increasing rates by 75 bips, actually they said we're not going to do much and then they cut. So that means people were going for growth. We had a massive ramp up of the growth, but, but, but since um, roughly September of, of, of last year, we have been uh, consolidating. Uh, so you can do the same with XLY. You can do uh, so quickly. We're going to be looking at those charts, um, which I just put it here. The one that I think is, is interesting and, and important if you think about cyclicality and how the US economy and the world economy should be doing is obviously looking at the industrials. Okay, so industrials, so this is um, a logarithmic chart. The trend is still your friend. My favorite chart is XLI versus the SPY. So here, let me give you a weekly chart. Why? Because uh, it tells me about the long cycle. Okay, so if you think about the cycle of the economies, this is looking at XLI, industrial versus the overall economy. So since uh, uh, after the, the great financial crisis, we have been trending in this cycle. So we had some hiccup in 2012, in 2015, mid 2015, summer 2015, when China was slowing, then we got the restart. And then actually before, the COVID, the market started to sell off. XLI really started to underperform. Um, and now the question is, can we go back into this level where meaning, you know, we get a strong um, uh, run for uh, uh, another economic cycle? So this is the kind of chart that I'll be looking, looking both on an absolute basis and on a relative basis. Um, you can be looking as well on the one that have been so strong here to date, which is XLM, but XLM, so important level at 52, 53, 54. So I played it um, at the start of the month. The month I was a bit too early, um, but I end up like uh, making a bit of money, but really tiny. Um, but the overall picture, you are still in in. Um, in the downtrend. So as long as we don't manage to go above this 55, roughly, um, the XLE picture uh, and XLE for, sorry, energy is not, um, is not that great. Finally, I'm just gonna be mentioning one stock, not that I'm long or short, um, but uh, let's do a daily. Uh, I'm looking at uh, US Steel, why I'm looking at, uh, looking at US Steel uh, just uh, in terms of infrastructure. So anything that has been infrastructure in Europe, in US, in the world has been extremely strong. Uh, the last couple, the, the, let's say the last couple of weeks, uh, those stocks have been up 20, 30%. Uh, but actually yesterday when Biden announced the, uh, this infrastructure bill, um, those stocks started to sell off. So as always, try to identify the sectors, the stocks that are leaders at any point in time. Okay, so recently we get the Metal Arcelor, we get the US Steel, we got those names that were really, really strong. 
when they turn, that means you don't want to be the trader that is the last into the move. And uh, now quickly, I want to go into um, bonds and looking at the US 10 years. So the picture, sorry, up US 10 years. So we are at roughly 170%. We are consolidating um, from one, between 150 and 170. If you think about the, the potential rebalancing yesterday, uh, nothing really happened. So um, the mutual fund didn't uh, buy more uh, or didn't buy more, didn't, just didn't buy any uh, bonds that much uh, or didn't, uh, so there was no rebalancing. Uh, so again, the question now is, do we stay at this level or do we go quickly into the 2%? If we go quickly into the 2%, so I think there's going to be a, a confirmation of, of, of stress in the market. Because at the moment, you know, if you think about the overall picture, and as I said a couple of weeks ago, the Fed is really happy with the situation. Uh, thinking that we are at 170 on the US 10 years, that uh, NASDAQ is at less than 5% from the total mile, S&P all time highs, all asset classes and the all time high, the economy is doing very well. You have inflation, but inflation is still below 2%. That is a perfect scenario. So there is really, it's a hot potato, but uh, everything is fine. If we look at the, at the 10 versus the two, which um, is zero to Y, so yes, this is the one. Uh, so that's for the, for the yield curve, you can see that the, the steepening of the yield curve has been pretty massive, massive. Um, so we are at 150, which is back to levels that were in 2016. And that helps as well as we discussed. And we can say it again, the banks, uh, for instance, uh, KBE and KRE. In terms of, of carry trade, I mean, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a, a big carry trade, but um, it's, it's looking at the, um, U.S. Treasury versus uh, the Bund, um, and why I'm looking at this is is to explain uh, why, if um, as an investor, if you're getting roughly two percent more yield when you long the dollar, whereas when you long euro uh, with with the Bund. Obviously, the carry is in your favor, and that is why that has been helping uh, the U.S. dollar and the attractiveness, the attractiveness of the uh, of the U.S. dollar. But think always looking at the, those carry trade. Um, that is true. Later, when we're going to be discussing currencies, looking for the Turkish lira or for emerging market currencies. Um, so look at the 10 years versus the two years, look at the uh, US 10 years versus the US five year, the five year as well. Um, commodities, uh, quickly looking, uh, so we're going to be taking the CL2 as always to avoid the, so we are at 61. Again, this is not a question of strong demand, this is a question of cutting the supply. So the Saudis, OPEC has been really proactive in, in trying as much as possible to limit the supply. If you think about the numbers, Saudis are producing 7 million barrels every day instead of 10 million, so that's 3 million less than usual. They will like the market and again, the US as well um, um, to, to be into, I think, the $60. Uh, so that helps everyone. Um, if we look at the, the other commodities, um, we look at Dr. Copper. So Dr. Copper has been consolidating. Uh, we are looking at this chart and I'm not pretending that um, I'm the best in, in, in chart. Uh, we are consolidating uh, the Chinese number overnight. Again, as I said, we are not great, great, great. Um, so uh, if is the, 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 the sorry, the um, commodity super cycle, is it on? That's obviously a big question. If you think about economic uh, uh, or super cycle, you are talking about 10 years. Uh, copper has been extremely strong, but has been strong because not enough uh, uh, supply actually. So um, for all those projects, between the moment you finance uh, the project for CapEx and the moment you are really mining those things, it takes, it takes quite a long time. So it takes, 
It used to be 12 to 18 months if you were in oil majors, but for mining, it takes the same 12 to 24 months. So there's going to be supply that's going to be coming, but there is a lot of demand due to electrical vehicles to all those cars that are coming. So you have natural drivers. Um, if we look at the gold, uh, so that we mentioned before, uh, why? Because it's down 10% year to date. It is trying to make a double bottom, um, which is around the 1675. Uh, so that's the hope for uh, the people that are uh, long. Uh, as long as the overall picture stays the same, um, the, 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 the trend is done for, uh, for the gold. Quickly, currencies, so euro dollar, again and again. Uh, your dollar. So I mentioned where we're at 122, 123. I said, you know, 116, 117. Um, if we look at the long term picture, so long term picture, let me do the weekly. So the weekly, I think uh, we are at around 116 uh, for the support. Um, and that kind of makes sense if you think about timing again uh, europe is going to be closed for the closed uh, semi-closed for the next two months because governments have been pretty useless in uh, with the vaccine um, at least you can say uh, that uh, trump did something very well with the vaccine uh, by buying everything and financing so the idea of, of the Europeans that don't want, we don't want to be spending two to three billion, uh, whereas the economies by being being closed is, is costing them, you know, tens of billions every, every month. It's just it's just insane. Um, so this is why the dollar as well is outperforming. But um, fingers crossed, uh, in uh, two to three months, Europe will be a bit better, even if it's slow. And really, it showed how inefficient uh, Europe has been uh, during the, the, this crisis. Um, so euro dollar, which one? Now? Uh, yes, I, will, I wanted as well to be looking at uh, the Aussie dollar. Um, Aussie dollar, okay, so that's a bit messy. Up. So here, this is the chart. There is a bit of, don't, don't blame me, uh, take everything with a pinch of salt. It's say uh, there's a bit of, of, of head and shoulder here. Uh, so the, the 70, 75 level is, is, is an important level. So have a look. Um, again, I think this is the correlation, obviously, with, for Australia with China is, is important. And, and the Chinese yuan, yuan, up, Chinese yuan actually uh, has been re reverting a bit. So all the currencies versus the dollar uh, have more or less the same picture. If you do this with the XY, this is the picture that you have as well. So everything is, is, is a bit of the same. But what is interesting is <laughs> a couple of months ago, every market participants and, and strategists were saying, oh, the dollar is going to be weakening by 5%, 10%, blah, blah, blah. And now they say, oh, well, 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 well uh, OK, when uh, oh, we were bullish, uh, you at 123. Now we are neutral at 118. So uh, uh, as always, be careful when all those people are telling you what to do. Finally, I just want to be looking at two currencies, the Turkish Lira. Okay, Turkish Lira, we know, we know the story. Um, so a bit messy, are really struggling, uh, struggling with um, their uh, balance of payments, uh, the economy overall, uh, and by firing their um, uh, bank governor, that, that didn't help. Uh, so we are now at uh, above eight. So, but interestingly, as well as we discussed before with emerging market, uh, I think the one really to monitor is the uh, Brazilian real. Uh, why? Because the economy is uh, experiencing, uh, not the economy, but uh, it might soon experience uh, a shit storm. Uh, this is really the worst economy in terms of managing the COVID. Um, so um, I think if we start to see the uh, Brazilian real um, weakening, um, that could be, um, so you're going to have the ETF that are going to be moving. You're going to have all the listed ADR that are going to be moving, but the whole region might be, might be moving. So in terms of emerging market, where could be the stress? I will be a strongly 
advise to put on top or close to the top of your watch is the, um, the Brazilian real, because that's going to tell a lot about what emerging market, uh, South America, Spanish banks, everything, you know, risk on risk off could do uh, suddenly. Okay, let's go back into, into the, uh, this presentation. So as always, quickly, the central bank. So here we are looking at the euro dollar futures. If you don't know what are the euro dollar futures, look at the uh, uh, um, past webinars, look at uh, you do Wikipedia, but more or less what it tells you is what are the Fed expectations from market participants. So if you think at 100 minus this, this is, that makes you 25. 0.25, which is where is the Fed these days at zero, between zero and 25 bips. Here, that was a couple of weeks ago. And let's look now at what we have here. So what we can see is from September onwards, everything has been coming down a bit. So we have been moving by between five to 15 bits. What is interesting as well is now, if you look at the December, 2022, we are pricing 99.5, which gives you 100% chance of the Fed uh, hiking uh, the Fed fund rates by 25 bits in December 2022. Okay, whereas uh, recently the Fed, Powell has have been saying, no, no, we're not going to be doing anything. Don't worry, guys. We know what they want to do. They want to, again, I repeat myself, run the potato very, very hot. Um, and it is running hot. And on one hand, they said, uh, we don't see inflation. There is no inflation because it's below the core PC, it's below 2%, which is below our mandate. And at the same time, they are telling us, we know that the numbers that are gonna come based on the reopening of the economy, based on the fiscal stimulus, based on the money storage stimulus is going to be very strong. So at one stage, they will have to do something. But a lot is, start, is starting to, not a lot, but at least something is starting to be priced in. If we look at December, more or less nothing was priced. So that is something that we discussed in January. I said, if you get expectations that inflation is going to come, it's going to go up. Really, that was a free ticket. Uh, looking at put options on those, uh, I think that we look at December 2023 uh, for the uh, euro dollar. Uh, so this is obviously coming with an economy that is doing better with inflation expectations that are uh, going higher. So here we are looking at the US break even 10 years, which is, a, um, let's say, a funny way. I don't want to make it too complicated, but it's it's giving you the the um, inflation expectation from market participants. Again, if you think about where is the Fed mandate, the Fed mandate is here, is at 2%. Okay, so we are above those 2%, but we know as well that last summer, the Fed said, and I think it was um, in, in August when they do their, their funny thing in, uh, I can't remember the name, in August, but they said, not that we are changing that they are changing the mandate, but they would be happy to have a bit more inflation into the system that to balance when we have weaker inflation. That tells you what that if it goes to three percent, they will still say this is uh, inside the mandate. I think at the end of the day, even if the Fed said they are very independent, they decide even if on Monday or Tuesday, uh, the lovely French lady from the ECB said, you know, uh, don't try to test the ECB. Uh, the reality is if, if the market goes ballistic, they will have to adjust and they will have to change the rhetoric. They were very uh, bullish in 2018 saying, you know, the US economy is strong. Then three months, so then we had the sell-off in December 2018, and guess what? They had to change the, the words, they had to change the politics, the policies. So the picture is now we probably gonna have a higher uh, uh, inflation than 2%, which, which makes sense because economies are reopening. Year on year, commodities have been on a tier, and you got as well. Uh, uh, the whole value chain uh, that has been struggling because you got friction 
uh, all along because it, it's harder to do shipping, it's harder to move things, it's harder to get um, uh, outsourcing, everything is harder. So, so you have a bit of inflation. So what the implication, we look at it before, is bond sell-off, is value versus growth. Um, and, and really what is interesting, if you look at Q1 performance across asset classes, there was a lot of alpha generate to do. As always, you know, it's super easy to say, much harder to do. So it, that would be easy to say, look guys, I watch long XLE and, uh, and long XLF, long Russell and short all the garbage and say, I've been doing 30%. I want to be honest, I didn't do that. I think very few people did it. Um, and, and really, if you can at least start to understand what are the drivers, make a bit of money out of this 20 to 30%, that'll be good. But it's almost impossible to have everything right. In this market overall, people have been struggling because there has always been part of their portfolio where they have been struggling, okay? So you have the guys on Twitter that tell you, oh, I'm long Bitcoin and I've been long Bitcoin for ages. Then they are, were telling you that bonds should be negative and they have been running bonds uh, from 1% from to 1.7%. So be care. Honestly, um, overall market, there has been a lot of, of distortion and dislocation. Something that I haven't put last uh, webinar and because I, I like to repeat things, and sorry for that, is central banks balance sheets. On the left hand side, this is the Fed balance sheet. On the right hand side, this is the ECB. As you can see, there is a lot of printing. Printing is still ongoing. So uh, uh, printing means that it makes uh, the narrative and the, and the perception from market participants much easier. As long as you know that the central banks are here, that uh, they are here to provide and, and, and to put money and to help you, most market participants are keen on putting risk. Um, and obviously that helps the financing of banks, that helps the, the, the financing, that, that um, um, something that the ECB lacks very much, that compresses all the spreads between different countries. That means everything is, is a kind of, is, 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 um, is full of, of liquidity. So next one, uh, let's move from the macro to um, what's gonna happen in the next uh, few weeks. Um, so in two weeks time, so it's, all, it's almost tomorrow because we get a long weekend, but that's really in two weeks. We get the earning season starting. I always use, uh, and most people use JP Morgan as overall the start of the earning season. So JP Morgan is coming with the earnings on the 14th of April. April, I'm always struggling to say April. So that's in a couple of weeks now. And uh, looking here at the S&P and those 11 sectors and what are the expectations uh, in, in, in Q1 uh, versus obviously Q1 last year. So everything, if you look at here, everything looks pretty much good except uh, real estate. Uh, why? Because um, uh, Q1 2020 was the start of the end of the world last year. So numbers uh, will be pretty hard to read year on year, quarter on quarter, they will be uh, uh, much easier to read. So those are the expectations. I think the next slide is, is uh, so, so the previous slide uh, and numbers were uh, from, from S&P. Here, those are the data from Refinitiv. And you can see the, uh, the change of expectations since uh, uh, from a year ago. Uh, and I, uh, so here, that is the expectations now versus uh, three months ago. As you can see, expectations have been ramped up quite a lot, and that is across sectors. Um, but um, what was interesting as well is the last quarter, which was Q4 2020, I think it was 80 to 90% of the companies in the US beat top line and bottom line. In Europe, they beat on the bottom line, but they missed on the, on the top line. Uh, so there has been a strong uh, momentum for companies to beat expectations. Um, so now, as always with earnings, is how much is priced in and how much uh, is not. 
uh, we're going to start to have uh, an answer with JP Morgan. If you look at the, um, the auction chain for the S&P and the auction chain for many big stocks, obviously, because there is many companies, big companies, big tech companies that are coming between the 20 and the 30s. There are many call spread that have been played on and, 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 um, and positioned. So this is why as well, I, I told you before that the change the market could be changing around the 15th, 20th of, of this month. Why? Because of the OPEX and, and, and so much positioning on the one-way traffic, the, the, the calls that we used to have. Um, something else that I want to mention, which is the seasonality. So uh, because I'm a bit lazy and I don't do that many blogs, I, I did a blog in, in, I think it was in August last year, where I discussed the seasonality of the market. And that was in mid-August. And I said, you know, be careful. We are coming in the, the weakest part of the year, which is September and October. And some educators made fun of me and actually I was right. And the S&P uh, caved, uh, caved in after. Here, if we look at what is coming now, which is this month, April has been a pretty strong month, uh, both for the S&P 500 in blue, for the NASDAQ in orange, and in gray, the stock 600, which, which is for Europe. Obviously, we if you if you look at the last twenty years, um, there are two times which were in, in two thousand nine and in twenty twenty, uh, where the lows the six 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 on the S and P in March twenty in two thousand nine, and last year the lows were in March. So that is a bit distorting the overall numbers, but normally the month we are in is a pretty strong month. That doesn't mean that. Uh, uh, the, the market is going to be uh, going up by two, three, four, five percent. But the odds historically are saying that. And as well, if you think about the market structure, if you think, if you look at the technical analysis, it's kind of telling you, you know, the 4100, 4150, if you want, if you think that there might be another move up, we're going to have another. Uh, two, three, four percent up. So seasonality, I like to be looking at seasonality, similar on index level, sector level, stock level. This month is a strong is, is a strong month. Then you know May selling men go away uh, is not necessarily a good month, which is very true for at least for, for, for Europe. But that is uh, the seasonality now that, that we have. Next one. Let's talk about Archegos. So maybe you have been reading, you know, tons and tons of papers and blogs and videos, and maybe you don't care anymore. Um, so let me tell you for me how it started. So that was last Friday, uh, around one o'clock. I was looking, uh, I was trading, and um, actually a couple of days before, I look at, um, at uh, Tencent Music uh, at TME. And the stock kept on coming down. It was trading at 25, 26. And I look at the chart and say, I'm tempted and I'm not tempted. Because very often after the expiry, you're going to have big moves. And, and if you look at the Chinese stock, if you look at those, you want to have a, a big discount. And you want really to have a big moves like people get, are going to get hammered. So I look at my Bloomberg and I start to see some those news where about those placements. If you think about the size of this placement, okay, so those placements were announced at literally, so this is UK time, so that's uh, 70 minutes before the US Open. So I look at it and say, okay, so 10 million Baidu, 50 million Tencent, 30 million uh, VipShop, and there was as well a placement on Viacom. But that makes you know, we are talking of placement of 1 billion, okay, 1 billion is, is a significant. If you, have, if you have one, that's fine. If you have one, two, three, four. So you had more and more placements that were announced in the market for stocks that actually have been absolutely hammered. So if you look at Tencent, it's coming from 40. Um, and, and those stocks, you know, were coming from 40 to 25. Then it was, you know, the pre-announcements was 1760. So what the question is, who was involved? As always, you know, 
And as I said, if I look at what stocks that have been moving, it's just not only to tell people, oh, you know, there is, I just want to know the, the three winners and the three losers. It's really trying to understand what's going on. Okay. So here, this is the story of Archegos, which is apparently a family office running 10 billion. So if you think about a family office running 10 billion, 10 billion, this is pretty significant. Normally a family office is about, as its name is saying, it's managing someone's money. Um, and that means this someone should be worth 10 billion. The problem that we have here is this guy is probably not worth 10 billion. And he was probably managing someone else's money because his Xbox was um, uh, less uh, rich as he was. So as I said, looking as a trader, you look, you read the tape. So there are news coming, you read the tape and say, okay, this is news number one, news number two. And the blocks, the placement kept on going. So 762,000 shares of Shopify. Shopify is trading at $1,200. Discovery, $36. We are talking a 20 million. So we know, I knew that something was wrong. Actually, I tweeted on, on, on Friday. I had no idea at that time what it was. So again, family office called Archegos run by a guy called Bill Wong. So the funny thing is this guy, I read a bit about his story, he used to be a sales, uh, a sales trader, a broker. So he used to be a broker and used to be broking some ideas to uh, Julian Robertson from, from uh, Tiger Capital. And because the guy was potentially uh, pretty good and giving some good ideas, he's, he went from being a sales broker uh, to managing some, some money. Then when uh, Tiger Management closed the business, uh, most of those guys opened their own shops, okay? And so they were called the, the, the Tiger Cups. What is interesting, and you know, it's just because I'm, 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 a bad, I'm a bad guy, is just be always very careful with sales trader. Okay, sales trader, they will always tell you that they are making a lot of money, that you know they are always the cold right, but trust me, it always ends up very badly. And we are not only talking about uh, 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 pseudo traders, but we are talking about educators as well. So if we look at Archegos, if we look at the five names that some of the names that they have, so here we are talking at Viacom, we are talking at Baidu, TME, VIX, and IQ. Those are the charts year to date, okay? So that was done uh, a couple of days ago. So they, they were long massively those names on, uh, so the fund, uh, the fund, the family office had apparently 10 to 15 billion capital, but had exposure to five to seven times what the capital that they have. Okay, so we are talking 50 to 80 billion, meaning that huge concentration. So here, this is Viacom versus um, Discovery. So you can see that actually this is, there is no alpha generation. This is exactly the same chart. So I don't even know why they didn't, uh, they didn't put everything into the, the same name. So everything was looking parabolic. So I remember, I think it was at the start of, of March, I had a conversation with one of my mentors and said, have you looked at, at, at um, Viacom? The stock has been, I think the stock was at 85 or 90 and it kept on going up. The thing is after GME, there were very few people that uh, <laughs> at, the, at the balls to go against those names, any names, because if you think about what happened, that was a, a squeeze cornering of the market that happened just two months before. So no one really wanted to go short those names. So what is the potential trigger for what happened? There are many theories. Um, I think what makes sense, one of the stories that makes sense is uh, last week we had a placement in Viacom. Okay. So last week when the stock was at 9,500, the company Viacom decided to do a placement both in terms of shares and so through some convertibles. Okay, so they more or less placed 3 billion worth of shares at around 85. Okay, so we can, yeah, 85. So here, this is for the placement, but we have the convertible as well. So that means suddenly, if you have been running those, all those positions like crazy on huge leverage, if your stock opened down with a gap of 15%, okay, that means 
stress in your portfolio. Then the stock kept on coming down. And I think that one of the reasons uh, it unwind the overall portfolio. There are other theories. I think another theory that I like as well is uh, if you think about the stress of someone losing money, you need to think, okay, where have we seen uh, um, stocks or assets moving big time? Okay, so obviously we are GM in January, we get the bonds in, 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 in February. And in terms of stocks as well, what moved recently, we had Volkswagen in Europe, okay? But Volkswagen as well moved big time in the US. And I read, I think I read yesterday that actually this Bill Wong uh, in 2008 lost a ton being short uh, Volkswagen. So maybe, I don't know the whole story, maybe the prime brokers call them. So the prime brokers, what we call the prime brokers, yeah, are the, the brokers, that are making uh, all the uh, the day-to-day -day, um, um, organization, let's say, for if you are a hedge fund or family office. So you put money with Credit Suisse, and Credit Suisse says, "Okay, you can be using that much leverage. You can borrow in my stock. You can uh, you can be lending the stock." So reality is, Archegos was having five to 10 position, extremely concentrated. But the beauty of it, if you are running a hedge fund, most of the time, you're gonna have two hedge funds. You're gonna have two prime brokers. So after what happened to Lehman in 2008, you don't, any, the, the hedge funds don't want to have all their eggs with the same prime broker. So to diversify your risk is like you, if you're worth a lot of money, you're gonna have your money with interactive broker and with E-Trade. You're not gonna put all your money with interactive broker. Because if interactive brokers goes down, you just want to be able to recover a bit of your money. So that's diversification. So all hedge funds in the world, most, as long as you have enough money under management, will be using at least two prime brokers. But the beauty with Archegos is they had five, seven, eight prime brokers. So question now is, and I read some stories about, you know, are they using <clears throat> the same uh, um, collateral with all their prime brokers, meaning saying, oh, I got a hundred and they said to Credit Suisse, to Nomura, to Morgan Stanley, to JP Morgan, to, oh, not JP Morgan, but Goldman Sachs, we can use them, which obviously doesn't, it, it, it seems pretty hard to believe. Or as well, maybe the regulator in the US give them, gave them, gave to the prime broker a call and say, look guys, you know, you should be looking at your leverage because we heard that they are running a very high leverage uh, book. So the trigger, hard to say, but if we look at the overall picture is we had five to seven prime brokers, okay? We had Credit Suisse, which lost, lost a ton, which lost apparently five to seven billion. We have Nomura that lost two to three billion. So that gives you already 10 billion loss. And we got Goldman Sachs who um, executed those orders. So if you, if you look at what Goldman Sachs did between Monday close and Friday close, okay? So if we look at the, those, only those five placement, Viacom, Baidu, TME, Vips, and IQ, you look at the move, here those are the moves over the five days, the placement that they have done and the differential of, of prices between the highs and the lows, we are already talking about a loss of 3.8 billion for uh, Archegos between Monday to Friday's close. And we know as well that Goldman Sachs were the first to pull the trigger. Okay, so they were very quick to react. Uh, I think um, which other name did it very quickly as well. I think Deutsche Bank did it as well. And Credit Suisse, we wanted to play it a bit gentleman and, and Nomura as well, actually get absolutely fucked. And they were sitting and they are still sitting, well, maybe they cut everything on big losses. But overall, if you have Goldman Sachs, if you look at the position and you look at the difference of prices, we are talking 4 billion. So 4 billion, you multiply that by three to four times or five times, you are talking between 10 and 20 billion. 
And if you think about it, that makes as well complete sense in terms of numbers, because if you use the 10, 15 billion capital leverage five times, that is, let's say 50 to 80 billion, and you use a 20% to 25% move, you end up with 15 to 20 billion loss. So crazy numbers, absolutely crazy. That tells you that actually all those prime brokers you know, those are the stories that we are in 2021. You thought that, you know, after Lehman, after all those stories of leverage, that would never happen. So those guys are having and offering huge leverage to their clients, okay? With clients, you know, that actually, it's not only the leverage, it's the concentration because you are putting, you are using 100 that you multiply. In reality, you're using 500, but across five positions. So that's very different than having 100 where you're gonna have 500 gross exposure and when you're gonna have you know, tons and tons of position. But that tells you that clearly there was uh, uh, something there wrong. So here, who are, and that's to come to the first few slides that we looked at is who were the big losers? It's not only the stocks that uh, Archegos was long, but here we got the chart of Credit Suisse in local uh, uh, Swiss in Swissy and Nomura in Japanese yen. So Credit Suisse lost said 7 billion apparently mark to market, uh, but in terms of, of market cap, it lost more than, than 5 billion. So if you look at this plus the green seal story, that looks really, really bad on the management and, and on Credit Suisse. But overall, what, what I would like to say is in terms of, of, of trading, what you could do is, um, when you start to see um, pressure, if you start to see uh, 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 selling like this one, and that's funny because even my son with 11 told me last week, he said, oh, but what you should be doing is you should be looking at what, where those companies holding. So most of the time, when someone is under stress, you go into Bloomberg and you go anywhere. So that's something that we did. I don't know if you remember in January, when we look at the Melvin Capital, we try to identify what Melvin was short of, because you know that they will have to be either forced buyers, which were the case of Melvin. So if you look at G GME, if you look at Evotech in Europe, if you look at uh, Advarta in Europe, or, or some other names in, in, in the US, everything were, was squeezed because they had to buy. And here, the opposite were, as they were long, they had to cut that position. What is interesting is, a couple of months ago, everyone was scared of being short some names, and now we are even scared on the opposite trade, which is being long. So um, despite the market being at all time high, that, uh, and that's very, very much, the, very often the case is when you have so much liquidity and such a big run, uh, the prime brokers, the, the risk managers um, are not as strong as they were before. And that means you have excessive um, first here, this is for the slide, this is excessive leverage. And when we look at leverage, this is something that I discuss quite a lot in the four by four video series. Um, this is five video plus five hours more footage where we look at gross exposure, net exposure. We look at gross exposure by assets, uh, by single name, and we look at concentration. So concentration is about the single name, on the single name, on the sector, in the industry. Um, in March last year, I did a YouTube video on risk management 101, which is called uh, Risk Management 101. Um, and maybe that might help you. Uh, what is interesting is what we normally call the smart money has not been really smart. So that was the case for the hedge fund in January. Uh, in, in, in March, um, uh, with this, this family office. That tells you as well that um, um, there are some excessive leverage. What is interesting, and I was thinking about this today, is if you think about the abnormal move that we had in bonds recently, I won't be surprised to know in the next weeks or months that some funds get absolutely murdered in the bond sell-off. Uh, why? Because the positioning, the leverage in the bond market is even worse. And we had literally a, a total outlier move in the bond market. So 
as retail investor, individual investor, um, you sh we should be looking at our leverage and our concentration. If you are in the US, you only get access to two times leverage, okay? In Europe, it's four to five times. In the US, be extremely careful because I know that there are many educators that are telling you, oh, what about you do leverage with options? And then you get hammered because if you, options are nice for, for, for leverage, but obviously you need a bit of education. So be careful on, on, on trusting those people. Don't do only option. Otherwise, as well, uh, if you look at options, look at your concentration. So your, your Delta net exposure, uh, be a bit familiar with the basics of, of the Greeks. Um, and as well, something that we discussed in the four by four, concentration and leverage. Uh, quickly, because we are running out of time. Um, so six weeks ago, uh, we launched together the trading community, which, um, so that comes with either with the four by four, if you've done the four by four, you get access to this uh, trading community. Or if you do the mentoring, you get access to the mentoring part of it. Uh, so that's about sharing ideas, sharing uh, risk management, sharing um, anything uh, that might help us. Um, so I like I like it very much. Um, I think it's get, it's getting a bit of traction now. We are between sixty and seventy people now. Uh, I think it's it, it's a good number. So very uh, a big thank for for all of you that are participating in, in that. In terms of education, uh, let me quickly describe what I do. So I do the four by four video series. This is, this is a product that I launched in October, 2019. So this is a very recent product, which is a good thing. This is why uh, some competition um, uh, have been kicking up the product. Uh, so this is based on four ways of generating IDs, top down, bottom up, special situation and active trading. This is based on my experience at both a hedge fund manager, portfolio manager, long only, and as well uh, a trader. So you're gonna have 40 plus videos, around 30 hours of footage or more, 50 plus Excel spreadsheets. Why? Because I want you to, uh, to have your own infrastructure and being able to generate IDs. Uh, so that this is something that you're gonna get. You're gonna have all the sources and I'm not gonna be asking uh, for anything else. Uh, mentoring program, this is, uh, the step, uh, another step further, which is, um, which works well with the four by four, not only this is something that we can discuss depending on your knowledge. Uh, so this is 12 weekly one-on-one -on -one online sessions through Skype or, or Zoom, depending, it doesn't really matter. Same, building your infrastructure, interpreting the macro indicators. Um, so this is depending where you are, either this is to manage your own money because you want to grow your personal wealth, or this is as well if you want to work in the industry or if you want to build your track record. Uh, one of my mentees, uh, I just presented it to one of my friends running um, a hedge fund. So he had an interview, get the job. Uh, I'm sorry for the other mentees. I presented two CVs um, and only this one was picked uh, because I try to filter the CVs. It's not like, you know, I'm going to present any CVs that I have in front of me. I try to have a good match with this hedge fund. Um, this is so, not something that I do every single day. I try as much as possible if I have something to present or help people when they get interviews. Um, because uh, some of you might have interest in the industry and I've done those interviews for, for, for the hedge funds. I haven't done the big banks and all these, uh, these politics things. Um, so for more information, you can go on dupontrading.com. If you like the videos, if you haven't subscribed to YouTube, please subscribe. Uh, if you want to add comments that help for the traction, if you get questions, please send me an email. As we are running a bit out of time, um, we're not gonna do a Q&A session um, and this is a long weekend. So I got mentoring sessions tomorrow, but if you have questions, I think it's it's nice as well to be uh, chatting with you and, and having email. So uh, please feel free to send me an email. I try to get to you as quickly as possible. And I want to believe that I'm pretty open. Um, and if as well, I know some of you uh, kindly send me some uh, suggestion for 
in the next webinars if you get specific questions because for me the struggle is i have 20 20 years experience i have some years of experience as as mentor but maybe things that uh, uh, look obvious uh, are not to you and i'm not judging anyone we are all different uh, steps in our learning curve so uh, that'd be nice as well for me to understand where i can help you so feel free to, to, to send me uh, an email and some questions. Have a good weekend. If you got a long weekend uh, of Eastern the market tomorrow, again, we get the NFP, a lot of noise, but um, thank you again for joining. And um, for those who are on YouTube, thank you as well for, for, for watching. Have a good, great weekend. Bye-bye everyone.